The following podcast contains adult subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I think actually Juan said this might be a little special edition of Thinking Outside the Long Box. Uh, this is Gabe. And on the line, I have Cullen Bunn, comic book writer and creator extraordinaire. Uh, you may know him from such titles as Haro County and Conan the Slayer, as well as his upcoming book with Brian Quinn, Metro. How are you today, Cullen? I'm doing great. I'm going to ask a few questions first about Harrow County. I'm a little bit behind because uh, I get my poll really weird, but I know the last issue is going to be dropping on Wednesday. How does it feel to be finishing up this book? It's a little surreal. Um, you know, I've been doing we've been doing this book now for you know three years. I don't know that Tyler or my nor myself we were ready for the book to end. I mean, this is we're we're ending the series where we wanted to. This is the story we've always set out to to tell, and and this is the issue that we've always intended to end it on. But it's still, I don't think we're we were ready for, ready to say goodbye to these characters uh, the way we have. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's. You know, like we talked about in the last interview, it's one of those stories that like really, really grabbed me and didn't want to let go of me. And every time I sit down to read it, I absolutely, you know, pound through the issue (laughs) because it's so good. And I'm it's kind of Shudder did the same thing to me where I'm like, I know that this is the right conclusion. I know this is the right spot to end, but I really, really don't want this to be over (laughs) ever. It's a fantastic book. I'm really excited to read the last issue, though, so. Well, I appreciate that. But yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's, uh, you know, the best stories have endings, you know, and uh, and that's we, we've got, you know, this, like I said, this is what we wanted to, to do with the book from the beginning. So. So when you're approaching the end of it, you know, you you have obviously like the deadlines to get it published and everything. Is it a huge relief to kind of have it off of your plate now, though? I don't know that a relief is the right word. I mean, it, it's it's nice uh, to know that we, we, you know, that we were able to do what we wanted to with it. Uh, but I, I will definitely miss it. It's a, uh, you know, and and uh, and like I said, I'm not sure relief is the right <laughs> the right uh, word because uh, you know at the end of the day, I, I, that is that was a you know as much as I love Harrow County for the the you know for the story of it all. It's also a paycheck for me, right? <laughs> so, so, say, so saying goodbye to it is a uh, you know is a little, you know, is a little a little weird and a, a little worrying. I you know I have to replace that work at some point, right? It's it's funny, you know, as as consumers of it, we don't always think of it that way. So yeah, that would make sense to be losing a little bit of a paycheck and going, oh crap, now I got to find something new to do. So. It, now what? Do, yeah, what what's what's next? You know, and then. <laughs> That's always the question with when when one of these things ends, it's always, you know, all right, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do now? So I wanted to ask a couple of questions uh, about Conan the Slayer. Like I'm a humongous Conan fan. And when I saw that you were going to be doing the writing for this particular arc, I was really excited. I knew kind of the direction the stories were going like chronologically from Conan's history. Uh, what kind of source material did you look at to to develop the story for Conan the Slayer? Oh, I uh, you know I looked at uh, first of all I've been reading Conan stories since I was a since I was a kid you know since you know I was since I discovered the the paperback editions of of Robert E Howard stories and I've always been uh, a, a big fan of of those of those stories and and as you said that you know there's sort of a, a there's a chronology that dark horse wanted to, to form, uh, that wanted to follow in terms of when, you know, at what takes place when, you know, there's a very specific order of the stories that they, that they publish. So I kind of, you know, I reread a lot of the stories surrounding, you know, the, uh, of what was, what came before and what's coming after, uh, the stories I was going to tell just so I could figure out, you know, where to, you know, where to position my stories, how to set up, you know, set things up for the stories to come and, and things like that. And then, yeah, I read a lot of, you know, I've got a bunch of books on, uh, they're, they're, I guess they're sort of like hy- Hyperborean history and, and, and you know, uh, you know, 
you know, geography and, and things like that, just to map out where stories were taking place and, and you know, where Conan might be traveling in between those stories and, and things like that. That's cool. Like it's, it's as a, you know, a big fan of Conan, like uh, that's the kind of thing that fascinates me. Like I listen to podcasts about Robert Howard, like, you know, critically and, you know, read books on like Hyperborean history and like, you know, have maps and things like that in my house. So it's, it's cool that you did like the due diligence to say, okay, like this is where he's at. This is how he got there. This is the direction the story's going. That's, it's cool. And it shows like in, in the book itself, like, it's like, yay, this is exactly where I expected it to go. And that makes me very happy. So, (laughs) yeah, you know, and and it was, it, it was intended to be, you know, a, a much longer arc. It was going to be, uh, you know, 24 issues was what I was, what I was contracted for. Things just didn't, <laughs> didn't work out that way. Right. You know, with the, with the license changing hands and, and things like that, it didn't all, uh, all play out the way everybody intended. You know, I, I, uh, I adapted the story of uh, the devil in iron and uh, the next story I was going to adapt is uh, the, the people of the black circle was going to be part of the series and then I had this whole other storyline with this ghoul creature that uh, that was going to play out and wrap up as well over the 24 issues. But, you know, you can't always control things like licenses. <laughs> right. So so with the change of license, you know, directly affecting, you know, the creation of the book, like, I mean, how did that? How did that news come to you? Did they just call you one day and say, hey, the license is going back to Marvel? Like, sorry. (laughs) Or Yeah, it it basically, you know, I got a call said, hey, I know you're you're writing your second arc. We have to end it, you know, with issue 12 or whatever it was. So I had to kind of wrap up. Uh, I kind of had to roll a lot of elements into this sort of final chapter of uh, the Devil in Iron story. Oh, man, it's. That's got to (laughs) suck, like, to just be handed that, you know, sorry, you got to stop doing what you're doing. Like, well, that that would be a bummer, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, you know, but but honestly, that stuff happens all the time. And, uh, you know, most of the time, it's not the fault of the publisher or the editor or anything. It just it's it's things that just that just happen. Um, But as I've worked in comics over the years, I've learned to uh, to roll with the (laughs) roll with those punches a little bit. That's good. You probably have to have pretty thick skin to work in in this particular industry, I'm guessing. <laughs> well, you know, there are worse jobs to have, believe uh, me. Right. <laughs> uh, much, much worse jobs. I've probably done most of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've probably done a lot of them, too. But, uh, you know, to some degree, you just have to be prepared for to, to change on a dime in some cases. You know, it's it's not uncommon for a story that you've got planned for you know, 24 issues or a hundred issues or 200 issues to, to get, you know, get word that you're ending at, you know, five issues or, you know, 10 issues or whatever. So you got to be ready for it. So you are currently have on Kickstarter uh, Metro, which is this new uh, dark fantasy, or as, as the site says, very dark fantasy book that you're doing with uh, Brian Quinn and Walt Flanagan. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you guys got started together on that project. So uh, several years ago, I was writing a new Lobo series for DC. And this Lobo was a very different take on Lobo than the one most fans were, were used to. He, was, you know, he wasn't the main man, right? He was, right. He was very, you know, very uh, slim and slick and uh, he, he just uh, a, a great departure from the main man. He's the Lobo that made everyone upset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people didn't uh, just didn't, you know, didn't like the, that, that character even existed, right. which is fine. One of the people, but uh, there was a day on Twitter that Brian Quinn messaged me and was just talking about Lobo, I'm not saying anything negative really, but just uh just talking about how he much prefers the main man and, and things like that. From those initial tweets, we kind of formed a friendship. We uh, we started talking. You know, Brian's always loved comics. Uh, I've watched. I had watched his TV show and Practical Jokers many times. So my wife was a fan, and and you know we watched it regularly. So you know, but uh, but I did not know at the time he was such a comic book fan. And then, uh, you know, we started talking about comics and we realized we liked the same kind of movies and the same kind of stories and the same kind of novels. And just over time, uh, I just asked him one day, I, I just messaged him and said, do you have any interest in in co-writing a comic together? 
Um, because I knew, I knew, you know, based on our conversations, he's always wanted to do a comic. He did, and we started talking about, uh, you know, what what we might do in a comic book. And and one of the things that one of the ideas that he had been developing for years and years, and just never. Uh, it never came together for him was this uh, this concept for for what would become Metro. And we started working on that together and turning it into a, you know into a comic. Brian uh, is on a, a podcast with Walt Flanagan and uh, Brian reached out to Walt and asked if he'd be interested in drawing it. And then that's really how it all came together. We've been working on Metro now for a couple of years, uh, getting it to to you know getting it ready to be released. So I have the San Diego Comic-Con like kind of teaser issue uh, that <laughs> yeah. has all the giant sensor bars on it, which is hilarious. And I can only assume like the grotesquerie that's happening like behind those sensor bars, knowing like you can, Walt Flanagan's art. You can you can thank Walt for those sensor bars because he was very, uh, very wary of releasing that teaser in San Diego and we, you know, we all went back and forth over what we could do to, you know, we thought about changing the pages that were in the book and, and things like that. But finally, uh, we decided to put these, these giant, annoying sensor bars all over everything. <laughs> and they're hilarious. Like the, the idea behind it is hilarious. Cause obviously it's like something that is out in the public at like the biggest comic book convention going, you know, you probably don't want to have your name attached to like the rotten corpses and dick pics is what I assume is happening back there. But well, the thing is that those sensor bars, I think make it so much worse. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I think it's a, uh, I think they actually, your imagination kind of goes wild with it. And, and the, the sensor bars make it a lot worse than, than it is. That's don't get me wrong. It's bad. <laughs> but, you know what's going on in those pages is not pleasant, but uh, but I think for some reason the sensor bars seem to make it uh, almost elevated a little bit. I just like I love the one that says you can't unsee this. Like that's <laughs> yeah. that's maybe well. my favorite one. <laughs> um, so right now the project is on Kickstarter. As we're recording, it's got I believe ten days left. Um, yes, and you guys are well past double of what you were initially looking for. Uh, tell me a little bit about how like the Kickstarter process has gone for you guys. And then also what made you to decide to do Kickstarter instead of, you know, going through, you know, a traditional publisher? Well, you know, we we talked to a number of publishers about this book. And originally our intent was that Metro would be a, you know, a series of, of single issues and it'd be told over, you know, is monthly issues. A number of the publishers we showed the book to were like, "Whoa, you know, we're not, gonna, <laughs> we, can't, we can't publish this, you know, because of this, you know, uh, it's funny because the first few pages we show, uh, you know, that we had to show publishers were the pages from this uh, preview edition you're talking about, a only they weren't censored, and um, a lot of publisher, you know, a few publishers said, you know, we, you know, we just don't think this is right." For us right now, you know, it doesn't seem to be the kind of book we want to have our name ta attached to. They're like, you know, we publish My Little Pony comics, right? No. Well, <laughs> you know, and a few did say, you know, uh, there were there were there were several publishers who wanted to to do the book, but as we really got into it, we just really wanted this to be our book. We didn't want anyone, you know, we didn't we didn't want anything to change what we were going to do with this. Uh, we set out for Metro to be this sort of unapologetic comic book, and uh, we didn't want we didn't even want the potential of someone trying to get in there and change that. And and we just decided it, it one of and and I've always personally wanted to run a Kickstarter. I've I've never done one before. Uh, I've always wanted to get involved in Kickstarter and do do one. Uh, you know, I have plans to do several a year if I you know several Kickstarters a year if I can if I can manage it. So we just uh, we got on the you know Walt Brian and I got on the call, a call together and just hashed it out and we just decided let's just do it ourselves. Uh, we we kind of contacted people who the the one thing none of us wanted to have to do was uh, the fulfillment. You know we thought that would be a nightmare for the three of us with our schedules to do. So we got people involved who can handle fulfillment for us and handle delivery for us and do all the you know do all those things and make sure everything runs smoothly. But but otherwise, we just wanted to control the book, and we wanted to 
to to do it our way. And that's why we decided to do it as a graphic novel instead of single issues and uh, and just collect, you know, the what would have been the first five issues is now collected all in, you know, in one book. So with with these first five issues, are there now plans to like move on to like a second story arc and a potentially like another Kickstarter or something like that? Oh yeah, uh, Brian and I already have the second story. We've already started talking about the second story, and we'll probably at the close of the Kickstarter, probably our last update before the Kickstarter ends, we'll kind of tease what the next storyline will be, and then we will, uh, and then we're moving right into into the next the next arc, and and probably you know the way I'm kind of envisioning it now is sort of like a series of of trade paperbacks. So, you know, the next, and, and they won't all be five, you know, they won't all be 122 pages. Some might be, you know, 60 pages or 80 pages. But we're going to start doing, you know, a series of these trades. Those trades will, you know, tell a much bigger story. This one tells a complete story, the one that we're, we have on Kickstarter right now. And our goal is that every arc will have a, you know, will have a beginning, middle, and end, but they will form together into, you know, a much bigger tale. So talking about the story, uh, for those of us, for those listeners who, you know, kind of have no clue what's going to happen in this book, tell us a little bit about the plot of Metro. So Metro follows this, uh, this guy, Hunter Murphy and Hunter is, uh, not a great person. He's a junkie. Uh, he's done some pretty bad things. And as the series begins, as the book begins, Hunter's dead. Uh, he wakes up in a morgue in New York City, and his memory is gone. He doesn't know who he is. The only reason he even knows his name is because of the toe tag that's, uh, that's on him. But uh, he finds that he has this strange connection to the city around him. The city seems to uh, respond to him in, in, in a strange way. So he kind of sets out to figure out who exactly, who exactly he is. The problem is he is also pursue you know his his awakening has drawn the attention of this group called the wide eyed three and the wide eyed three are these uh very uh they're mur- this murderous group of conspiracy theorists is about the best way i can uh I can describe them and they have decided that Hunter Murphy and his resurrection is the key to them being validated all of their crazy conspiracies and supernatural uh meanderings will be proven if they can prove that this guy has come back from the dead. And they set out to catch him, and they'll kill anyone that gets in their way, including Hunter, to, uh, to prove their point. And then just, from there, it's just kind of this adventure story. of, of It's a crime story, and it's an adventure story, and it's a supernatural fantasy where he's trying to de- figure out uh, you know, who exactly he is, what's his purpose, how did he come back from the dead, why does he have these weird, this weird connection to the city. And and all that is kind of what the, the those are all the questions we sort of answer in the first uh, in this first book. So you know, look, reading the teaser and like you know the the way Walt's art is, and then kind of looking at his sketchbook in the back, I I noticed that very interestingly, like it's always described as you know adventure or crime or dark fantasy, but you guys never talk about it being a horror book. Is is there like a conscious decision to like steer away from thinking of this as like a horror comic book? I don't know that it's it's a, a conscious decision. There are absolutely horror elements in this story. I mean, one of the wide eyed three is possessed by a demon, <laughs> but you know th- there there's a lot of other horror horror tropes that we we visit, um, and some arcs of Metro, some future stories of Metro. Are absolutely one thousand percent, you know, balls to the wall horror stories. But uh, this arc in particular, uh, it just has more of a fantasy feel to me. You know, it's a, uh, you know, it it, it 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 it's not it's not as much. Even though there are a lot of dark elements and a lot of horror elements, it's not full blown horror. It's it's much more of a fantasy story. There's a lot of humor in this too. I mean, it's a there's a lot of humor in the book. It's sort of uncomfortable, weird humor, but it's it's humor. But uh, I don't know. It just felt more of uh, this. This one in particular feels more of a like more of a fantasy story. But I don't think we ever said to ourselves, let's not never call it a horror story, because 
uh, I could very easily see Metro Book Three being subtitled a very dark horror story. You know, it's uh, because, you know, uh, and that's actually interesting. You know, maybe we'll do that. Maybe the next one won't be uh, a very dark urban fantasy. It'll be a very dark uh, Western romance. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, a very dark sex fantasy. I don't know what it might <laughs> be. <Nice. laughs> so, but, you know, you know, who knows with Metro? It re- it's a book that can go in a lot of a lot of very weird seedy places. <laughs> so working with with Brian Quinn, who is like a New Yorker, Like, clearly he has, like, this intense love for the city, but also, you know, he, as a firefighter, he's seen a lot of crazy shit, I'm sure. And then on top of that, he seems like an incredibly funny person. Like, obviously, Impractical Jokers is hilarious, and when he's on, tell him Steve Dave, it's, you know, it's he's always super funny on the show. How do you feel he brings, like, New York and his humor to the book? Well, I mean, uh, you know, absolutely it's funny because I was just going through letters of uh, of one of the chapters of Metro just before this call, and uh, and and it's it's very obvious to me, you know, Brian is is born and raised New York, and and that comes across, you know, as many times as I have been to New York, I'm not born and raised New York, and that's not, you know, there there are going to be things that Brian gets and Walt, you know, from from Jersey. You know, that there are things that they get that I won't necessarily, you know, that I won't that I won't get. And he brings those elements of New York City to life in a in a pretty big, you know, in a in a, in a big way. And then, yeah, you know, he has a he has a very, uh, you know, particular brand of humor that uh, that's in the book. And I think uh, it's funny because, you know, I have you know, I have my own sort of brand of humor that uh, that I like. He has his and I and, and I think there are moments of, of both in the book. And it's nice to see how they play against each other. Then to touch on on Walt Flanagan's art, like he has like a really particular uh, art style that like seems very kind of hyper detailed in a lot of really interesting ways. What was it like to see the first like images of of the, you know, the stories that you and Brian had written? You know, it, it was it was uh, that's to me, that's the best part of working in comics is getting that kind of, you know, getting those emails that say, hey, here are the character designs for for this character or, or, you know, here are the first few pages. It's one of the things that makes comics fun for me because there's always something. Once once the ball gets rolling, you know, pretty much every day or every couple of days you're getting, you know, something in the email to keep your excitement, you know, going. So, you know, it was, it was super fun. I think one of the first images that Walt sent us was, a, was the demon, uh, the demon character, Judy, it was the first thing he drew for the book, which was, which was, I thought it was an odd choice as our first image to see, but I like, you know, it was, it was an awesome demon. It was funny to me that that was the first thing he drew and he, and, and he definitely connected. I think we've all connected to these three characters, the wide eyed three. I, I, I hesitate to say they're my favorite uh, because those kind of characters should never be anyone's favorite, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure Brian would say they're absolutely his favorite. And I think Walt might say they're his favorite as well. Um, they're, I mean, they're they're definitely uh, they bring a different dynamic than than what I think a lot of people have seen to the book. That's awesome. It sounds it it, it sounds very different from like other things that that I've read. And this is you know this is the kind of book that's as most books that you work on <laughs> are are right in my wheelhouse. Something super strange, supernatural. Things are weird. Some things are super gross. Like you know. It, it just seem it seems creative and different in a way that I haven't ever heard before. And then reading the the preview definitely piqued my interest and made me very excited. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, you know I, I think it's going to be a I think like I said I think it'll be uh, this trade will take people uh, aback a little bit. They won't I don't think people under will see this coming because it's a it's a book that you know at first it's kind of got this absurdist level of fantasy and hyper reality and hyper violence. And then it gets sort of these these really you know these 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 heavy emotional beats that come into it. And then you know to give you guys a I'll give you guys a, a teaser of things to come. What's really exciting because you brought up New York. What's really exciting about it is future arcs don't take place in New York. It it, it moves outside of New York, so we get to explore other metropolitan areas in a in, in some really cool exciting ways. Which is one of the reasons every arc is going to be so different because different cities are so different. And uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's. I think it'll be a, a lot of fun. 
if you uh, need a consultant on your Denver trade, I am. I have lived in Colorado my whole life and spent a lot of years living in Denver. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to keep. I'm, I'm making a note right now oh, when we get to Denver. That'd be awesome. <laughs> so. When the Kickstarter is over, you know, obviously the fulfillment end of it kicks in. All sorts of, you know, books are going to be shipped out. You know, all of the, you know, rewards for people that, you know, bid all the different amounts are going to start coming out. How are people going to be able to get a hold of the book outside of that loop of Kickstarter? Yeah. So first of all, one of the, the nice things about this is this is not one of those comic book Kickstarters that you back. And then wait two or three years to or longer to get your comic book because it's done. I mean, Brian, Walt, and I are finished with the book. It's, you know, every page is is ready to go, you know, pretty much with some minor tweaks here and there. And all we have to do really is, you know, we have to there's some there's a few things like, uh, you know, thank you pages and things like that that have to be, you know, kind of, you know, designed and put into the book but we'll deliver on this pretty quickly. So that's nice for the people who back it on Kickstarter. But we're also arranging distribution for this into bookstores. So we're going to make sure everybody who kicked back it on Kickstarter has their copy, and then we're going to open it up to comic book uh, uh, to, to bookstores. Comic book retailers can back the, the Kickstarter. You know, we have a level just for retailers so that they can get books in their store when everybody else gets theirs. You know when the, when all the Kickstarter backers get theirs, but then we'll we're going to make sure that uh, in the future people can order it from their favorite comic shop or bookstore and be able to get it as well. That they they won't be able to order the limited edition hardcovers. Those will only be you know through the Kickstarter. You know some retailers might be buying some, and so they might be in their stores that way. But the trade paperback will be able to get you know we're going to make sure we can get those into uh, into bookstores as well. We've already worked out. The same people who are helping us with our with our uh, fulfillment and delivery are, are helping us with that distribution as well. Very cool. So Kickstarter's almost over. Book's ready to go. What are you going to be working on after this? Oh my gosh, it's just back to the Harrow County thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, like I said, uh, I'm uh, you know I'm going to be doing more Kickstarters. I'm already developing the next thing I'm going to do, which is a horror anthology uh, that that I've I've got developing that'll launch in October. But then uh, you know I'm also doing a lot of other comic books. I'm I'm doing uh, I've got a book launching called uh, Bone Parish through Boom, which is a uh, uh, a, a New Orleans-based family crime drama uh, about a family of drug dealers. It just so happens that the drugs they are dealing are the com are com are composed of the ashes of dead of dead bodies, and uh, that's my next you know probably my next big creator-owned launch. But then I'm also you know I'm I'm developing some new stuff for Dark Horse. I'm um, I'm doing uh, um, Shadow Roads for for Oni Press. I've got a book called As Guardians of the Galaxy coming out for Marvel um, in a couple of months. The first issue of that comes out. You, you know I'm going to stay busy as long as uh, as long as I can. I'm going to stay as busy as I can. That's awesome. I, I'm glad to hear that because like I, I mean I pick up most of your stuff. So <laughs> I well thank you. I, I was even one of the the vain Lobo defenders because <laughs> I thought hey, you know those you know Lobo. Uh, it's funny. I saw just the other day someone was talking about Lobo online, and you know you know it was one of those books. I, I get why people didn't like it, but uh, there were there were a few of you who actually enjoyed the new version of Lobo. I just thought it was such a cool idea that he was like the primary version of Lobo. And that's why he was like nice and looked good and stuff. Right. And that well, main man they, was the, the bad version. <laughs> right. If they had let me do what I wanted, what I pitched to DC and I've told this story elsewhere, uh, when they asked me to do Lobo and that, this, this, you know, sleek, good looking Lobo had already been created in another DC book. And uh, but when they asked me to do Lobo, my or original pitch for it was, well, that's fine. But good looking Lobo and the main man Lobo are brothers and they're going through space together on odd couple adventures. And uh, I really wanted it to be the Lobo brothers. And I pitched pretty hard for that. And for whatever reason, they just wouldn't go for it. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it's still I still like that idea. I still want to, to pitch it to D.C. right now. But uh I know that I would get either crickets as a response or uh, just laughter, just laugh, <laughs> just laughing. 
guy calls, laughs at you, hangs up. <laughs> yep, that's how it works. Well, Colin, how can people find you online, you know, social media and all those things to keep up with the myriad of things that you're working on? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, my website's pretty easy to remember. It's cullenbun.com, and you can see, you know, links to all the things that I've got going on right now. And uh, also, I'm pretty active on Twitter, um, and, and that's easy to remember, too. It's just at Cullen Bun. Uh, so you, you can follow me on Twitter or, or hit me up on my website. And then, you know, I've got e-newsletters and Facebook pages and all that stuff as well. But Twitter and the website are probably the best, the best couple of ways. And then Metro, if you just go to kickstarter.com and type in Metro, you usually, you can, it'll pop right up. Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about uh, Metro and the other, the other stuff that I wanted to talk to you about, but Metro is the important one. <laughs> uh, well, it's all important. It's all super important. That's what, that's the, if we can, if we can deliver any one message to your listeners, it's that there is nothing more important than my comic books. <laughs> nice. <laughs> in the world. In the in world. world. In the whole wide world. There are no more important considerations right now. So j just keep that in mind, everyone. It'll make you sleep well at night. And, and if I can put in my bid that you pitch to be a writer on the Marvel Conan. <laughs> oh, well, you know, let Marvel know. I would, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would. I would love to write more Conan. There are definitely more Conan stories in me. Oh, awesome. That is, that is awesome. But thank you again so much for your time and for coming back on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, maybe I'll wave at you at San Diego Comic-Con this year. So Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Well, have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Thinking Outside the Long Walks podcast. Join us on Facebook and Twitter to get behind-the-scenes information for exclusive content and to be notified when new episodes are available. The thoughts and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent or reflect those of the Thinking Outside the Long Box podcast, Barron Space Productions, its partners, or affiliates. The Thinking Outside the Long Box podcast is made available by its creators, Juan, John, and Gabe. The podcast is edited and produced by Juan, and Alby is the co-executive producer. The Thinking Outside the Long Box podcast is a barren space production. <laughs>